I am a Gantt charter. I am an action step person. And so then when I can take a step back from that, then I can say, okay, let me make some real progress forward now. What is something I can get done, get it off my plate? And look, I answered that email. You know, that those little wins, um, if you allow yourself to celebrate them, can be huge. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast, friends. I'm Kim Skorupski, and you've joined in for the Triple H series, The Habits and Hacks from Hopkins. Hey, guess what? We're closing up on the end of the year, and we're going to be starting a whole new series, and we want you to be in the podcast, different topics and conversations. So why don't you shoot me an email at kskorupski at jhmi.edu. That's kskorupski. K-S-K-A-R-U-P-S-K-I at J-H-M-I dot E-D-U or go to the facultyfactory.org website and you can send me an email through there. So here we are and I'm looking at the lovely face of Dr. Sarah Amond and you will recognize her from not too long ago. I think it was episode 142 where Dr. Sarah talked about collaborations and diversity and collaborations and gave us all kinds of wisdom and insight and tidbits about how she has worked her model of good collaboration. So welcome back, Sarah. Thanks, Kim. It's really great to be here again today. What I wanted to talk about what I've been thinking a lot about lately is that um, we talk about models of leadership and we think and talk a lot, I think, as leaders in our fields of labs, of clinical practice, of administrative duties, of teaching um, about how we want to lead and the qualities that we want to bring to that leadership and that we want to bring to our career and that we want to bring to our everyday life. Um, and I think that's a really important part of mentoring is keeping an idea of what are the qualities that we want to bring to our teams. Something that we don't talk enough about, I don't think, is how do we actually actuate those qualities? How do we remember after a really frustrating phone call or um, after somebody sends us a flame email or after you just have a bad day, how to still do those things? Um, And so in the theme of habits and hacks, um, especially wanted to talk through and share some ideas about how can we can remind ourselves and sort of reinforce the type of leadership um, and and the type of mentoring, especially that we want to bring to a space. That sounds perfect. I love it. Um, So I have three sort of categories here that I think about. One is a visual reminder. Um, The next is an active reminder, which is uh, one that I'm very excited about. And then the last is time with intention. So we're going to start off with a visual reminder, a static reminder, which is something I think that many people are familiar with. Um, And some things that you already have in your offices, you already have in your homes, um, you know, we all put diplomas on the wall. So we put diplomas on the wall to credential ourselves to other people, um, but they also serve another purpose hanging there and to remind you that you did the work to get your PhD, to get your MD, to get your bachelor's degree. You, uh, many people also have pictures of their kids or pictures of their dogs or, um, you know, whatever is important outside of the office. Um, just as a, and really what that is, is a reminder is that there's something other than you outside of yourself. Something that we maybe don't spend as much time with is what do I want to surround myself with that will remind me to serve my team in the way that I want to. Um, So a a way that's really accessible for a lot of people is the post-it note system. Mm -hmm. Um, So Kim, I I think you shared with us um, last last podcast I was with you, um, what post-it system that you have in place to remind yourself. Oh my gosh, I'm a huge post-it person. I'm all over my monitors. It's it's almost borderline ridiculous um, because I just love little quips and reminders and acronyms and word plays. And yeah, the wait is my big one. I think I shared with you the why am I talking? Wait, 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 because I talk too much and I and I try to remind myself um, to not do that as much. So yes, love the sticky notes. 
Yeah. And really what that is, is a visual cue as you're going about your day. Um, I think we all spend so much time on Zoom that like around your monitor is a really good place. Um, I am back in person. I have a wet lab. Um, so I also put them out by my door. So I see it as I'm walking out and about to engage with people in the lab. You can also set tone the other way. Um, so one of my uh, lab laws is to think big which is from the tradition of John T. Caldwell, who um, was a great leader at my alma mater, NC State University. And so it's think big. You don't know how extraordinary you might be. So right there on my, on my door, people have to walk past that um, and sort of to set the tone of how, how do we think here and how do we want to think here? What do we aspire to? Um, some post-its that I have around, some people make fun of me a little bit for them, but that's okay. It starts a conversation. One is NAP, which is non-anxious presence. So how do I bring a non-anxious presence, especially to um, my students, especially in time of COVID? Um, another one that I have um, that's been very important for me, um, I'm an equestrian and something that every horse trainer has said since there was horse training um, is to just ride each footfall. So you ride the horse you have at that moment, at that exact second, and you leave the past behind you, you grow on it, you build, um, but you don't get caught up in it and you don't get caught in the anxiety of what, what might happen next. Um, so have confidence in the space where you are. Um, and so whatever is meaningful to you is what you should have. Um, and sometimes it might look a little bit silly. You know, I had, uh, I knew somebody who had a sketch of a seagull um, as their post-it. And it was because they saw something on the internet that said, today I will be happier with a seagull with a french fry, uh, right? Just sort of as a like, oh, I do find joy in this. This is something I like. And to just give yourself a little bit of a break. One thing that's important with that, and um, I, I'm sure we many of us sort of have the graveyard of post-it notes that have fallen off behind our desks, but is to revisit them and to get rid of the ones that no longer serve you and also to move them around because after a while, you're just not going to see them anymore. Um, and so I do this um, at the end of every NIH cycle. Uh, so <laughs> when grants go due and my brain is dead, um, that is that is my time to reset and say, how do I want, how do I want to face the next few months with my team? I find that's a little bit easier than like once a quarter, once a month, uh, because my brain is tired and I'm ready to really renew uh, what I want to bring to the team. Can I just kind of pause here a little bit? Because I, I want to let this sink in a bit. I like the idea of shuffling things up. So you're thinking the Feb 5, June 5, October 5, New Year's for some other people, time change. You know, those are symbolic of renewal, refresh, bookending something. And I, and I like that. I want to think about that more about moving things around because we Maybe some of us grew up in households. My mom would like to re, um, what's it called when you move furniture around? Would re, what's it called? Re. Oh, all I can think of is like rearrange the furniture. Re decorate. Yeah. That was it. Rearrange. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Rearrange the furniture. And you'd come home one day and be like, whoa, whoa, what? And so it was a little bit jarring, but I think it's, so I'm, I'm trying to think about that. It, it like freshens things up. It reframes how we look at things. It may be like uh, challenges our brains to rethink things. And I was just sharing with Sarah. Now I'm going to share with the world and I'm sharing with everybody I see. And I'm one of these now obnoxious um, dog rescuers. I just rescued a dog last week and I'm over the moon. And I'm thinking today as we are walking, I take him on different routes and I'm like, isn't this great? And I'm talking to him like, Sonny, don't you like this? There's so many things we can explore and it's never going to be the same walk. And now you're making me think it's the same thing with us. Well, like with anything, two sides of a coin, although structure and routine is there's some safety, there's some cure security, there's some uh, predictability. It's also important. I like how you're saying that to like move and rearrange the sticky note furniture so that your brain goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Oh, that's a new smell. I've never smelled that smell before as my new dog said. Well, and also to revisit what I need now is not necessarily what I needed six months ago. Um, and that that also sort of allows you to take a second. And this isn't hours, right? This is on the order of minutes um, to revisit and say, well, have I moved past that? Do I need something else now? Um, 
it, it, have, have I sort of achieved what I wanted to achieve with that and, and move on? Yeah, pr- um, pruning, pruning away. And you're, you're making me think also, I'm real quickly, I'm going to say this real fast. Um, of the, I always give examples in the WAG, when I did the WAG program, the writing accountability groups, is that when you first start a new habit at the gym, maybe back in the day, you'd have a clipboard and you'd pull your file and the, the trainer told me to use this machine, this many reps, this is how I do it. And you'd look at that recipe a lot. But then after right. you go into the gym a number of times or after you've made the brownies a number of times, you don't need the recipe anymore because as you're saying so perfectly, it's um, it no longer serves its purpose or you've achieved that. So you can get rid of that reminder because, okay, good. Next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think another thing is that to keep professional image, I think many of us sort of pause to putting more unusual things in our offices or in our workspaces. Um, you know, I have a illustration of a cat uh, because I really love my cat, right? So that, and that's there, that's okay. Um, I have other art that was made. Yeah, I think somehow it's okay when it's from your kids or your nieces, nieces and nephews to put their artwork up on the wall, but that can be something for you too. Um, something I always have up on my wall is the very first piece of independent data I made ever. No. I, have a, I have a photocopy of it ever. <laughs> and, you know, and it moves around my office and it's really important because it's, it helps remind you the sense of wonder. It helps remind you the sense of accomplishment, how challenging that was, how far I've come from when that was made, you know, years and years and years ago. Um, and that that's okay. We don't need that. We can have permission to put, to surround ourselves with things that are important and have meaning. Love it. So that's number one. Number two are more active reminders. Um, And I forget where I got this idea from. I think it was probably from a TED Talk or or something like that, but it's been very meaningful for me. So there are some things that we do dozens of times a day. Um, So Kim, I think you'll appreciate this one is your J-head password, right? How many times a day do we have to enter in our J-head password? Even if it's just once, and if it's just once, you'll just tell me how you manage that because I feel like I'm entering it and over and over and over again. Right. Um, but that can be a very meaningful, repetitive reminder of what you want to bring. So what what value do you want to bring to your lead, to your leadership? Um, so, for example, if what you are focusing on is servant leadership, um, then you can change those letters around, you can move them into different places, but really what that is, is when you set that intention, when you first made that password, it is a reminder of, I am facing this day in the spirit of servant leadership, or I am facing this day, um, in a spirit of patience or empathy or whatever it is. Um, and maybe it will be the word with a bunch of special characters around it. Maybe it will be a role model or mentor who sort of exudes that. Um, but this this helps with both uh, password security because um, they're kind of funny combinations of, of words and letters, um, but also it's just a reminder because you're putting it in over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, another one um, that I think a lot of people could, could have the opportunity to use is your voicemail pin. That's four digits. Uh, Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood um, is really famous for, he's, he thought that there was special meaning to the numbers 143, uh, which is the numbers and I love you. So what is a series of numbers that is important to you? I think a lot of us use birthdays or you use your address. Can you sort of make yourself a, a puzzle, a riddle that makes you stop and think? And that's seconds. That's microseconds. That's something, though, that every time you're entering it in and you have to change it periodically, it it just reinforces what you want to bring to a space. Is it also, Sarah, the the active reminder? Is it um, in addition to something that we do repetitively all day, the passwords? Is it also something like a a um, a gesture or a behavior that I'm thinking of? I don't know where I got this, maybe some Reader's Digest story or something where uh, um, in this instance, it's a man who'd come home from busy day at work. And before he'd enter the house, he would just touch the tree in front of his Mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. And it was just symbolic to him that he was leaving work at work. And so when he was coming home, he was kind of like putting that stress of the day aside by touching the tree. And now he was 
going into the home and it was a new, a way of shaking up the, the right. Story. Also something yeah. like that. I think also something like that. I think something that um, many on the hospital campus will appreciate it's a, a similar sort of routine that hasn't been since COVID, but at the Jesus statue in the dome building in Billings, you know, where people would just, you know, pat the foot as you go by as sort of, I'm here, I'm part of this community. I think some people use that as a place of prayer. I think some people use it as sort of a, a, a touch point of transition. Mm-hmm. And what do I want to bring? Yeah, yeah. But I think that idea of sort of touching a living thing as your transition, saying good morning to your kids, that's a transition. Um, but there are these routines Again, this is sort of the opposite of what we were just talking about. There, there are these routines that we can get into to serve as, as points of reflection and, and meditation, just sort of very briefly throughout our day. It doesn't need to be a half hour long session. Yeah, yeah, love it. Um, and then the last thing I, I wanted to talk about was um, to spend time with intention. Um, and this is one where I, I sort of um, have struggled with what to call it. Um, but the naming of people is an important practice. Um, so I think we have certainly heard that much more over the last few years um, with some of the um, racial reckoning um, that we have experienced in, in the city of Baltimore and elsewhere and that continued struggle of say their name. Um, I think that it is also true in many prayer traditions to, to say aloud a person that you want to remember. So taking it outside of religion, one reason why that's a tradition that exists across many different religions and many different cultures is because that has meaning. Um, and to name the people in your team and to hold them in your thoughts for two reasons. Number one, to offer gratitude for them. They're here working with you in your team towards your mission. And that is a huge gift. So number okay, two. Sorry. Hang on a second, Sari. We, we lost it. It was a little bit garbled. I want to make sure people understood because naming them shows gratitude. Gratitude. Shows gratitude. Yeah. You know, that you are taking a moment and saying, Kim is spending an hour with me today. And that's an hour of her life that she is spending with me to talk about things that are important to me, that are important to my mission. And that is a gift. Um, the second piece of that is especially leaders of teams that also allows you to do a mental check-in. How are they? What do they need? What do they need this week, this month? Uh, how have they grown? Where are they struggling? Um, and again, this doesn't need to be a long thing. Um, I do this in my walk in, um, I, I park in the Caroline garage, I walk up the hill through the dome building and I work in Marburg. So it's a five minute walk. Um, and so I, I think about my team in that five minute walk. There are about 15 of them. And so I hold each one of them, sort of name them. It's almost doing a roll call. Okay, that's who they are. This is what they're working on. And this is how I can help them better. Or this is, you know, they really need a push. It's time for them to swim the deep end. Or, you know, we should maybe pull that back a little bit. And again, this isn't a long belabored thing. It's a taking a moment to say, how do I want to enter the space and interact with these people who are really, really critical to my mission, my lab's mission, what we want to get done today, whatever it is. Um, and so then you are already mentally prepared, mentally primed to start your day and start your interactions with them. Uh, and that is, can be a very meaningful and very simple, easy experience uh, where it's not, it's not adding another meeting to your list. You're not doing anything else on the walk-in in the mornings anyway. Um, use your brain power for this. Yeah, I'm wondering you're clearly um, setting great examples, and I and I love how you've done something unique here with it with your wisdom, Sarah. Is that you're giving us concrete examples of how to actually um, do the leadership? You know, it's one thing to be and learn about leadership, but how does it activate? You know, how do we actually do it? So, I'm wondering if your team members do they know you hold them in your thoughts? Is that part of your outward persona. So is that the culture you have set up? So you, so people know 
that you yeah so i i don't think that many of them would be surprised um I, I, I never had the conversation with them to say, this is a thing that I do. Um, but I, I don't think that because of the culture we, or I hope, I hope because of the culture we, we try to foster here, where we really value reflection, um, both in our work and in how we do our work, that that wouldn't be a great shock. What, what about when things go bad? So I, I can see the visual, the static reminders, the post-its, they can be hanging there. And I could look at them. And as you said, it's times of stress. It's you're prepping for that October 5 deadline for NIH. And you're not seeing those post-it notes, or maybe you've added a thousand more because you're getting the grant application ready. But those post-its stay there. The password, you're on autopilot. You're not thinking about passwords. You're touching hugging trees, whatever. That's kind of routine. You've not even thought about it anymore. Just like some of us drive somewhere and we realize how in the world did I get here? I'm on autopilot. I don't even remember driving here, but I'm here. But this in time with intention, what happens when things go wrong and you're under, we're under stress? And when we as leaders don't feel like, you know, we're not supported or we're, you know, having all this pressure, we're being squeezed, 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 squeezed. And we have the best of intentions but things are going cattywampus. How do yeah. you, you know, how do you? So I, I have two thoughts there, maybe three, two and a half. Um, the first is take a walk, move, physically move yourself out of whatever space you are in and go take a walk, go take a walk outside, go do the main loop, um, whatever it is, let your thoughts come and go and, but, but move, be out of the space. That I think is number one. When I, when I am walking to get out of the space, um, I often will turn back to um, naming people I work with, um, in part because there is always something good and something, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but something that is moving forward with at least one of them, uh, right? And and if you, if you really work to find the good, um, that can help shift your brain back and get out of this panic, mad, whatever it is, um, to be able to then do work. Um, and that some days is really hard. Um, I distinctly remember hearing, it was like on This American Life, it was one of the NPR shows um, where somebody was talking about how to practice gratitude, even when you are just so hacked off, how do you handle it? And they said, well, everybody has road rage, right? Everybody hates driving and that person cut you off and you can either curse at them or you can say, I'm really grateful my brakes worked. And it takes the same amount of energy. Um, and doing the one raises your blood pressure and makes you more angry. And so then when you get into work, you don't want to hold anybody's name in your head because, you know, screw them all, right? Or you can say, I'm, I'm really glad my brakes worked. Thank goodness. Thank goodness I can go to work today. And then that can be a really simple, small thing. And, and some days it really is just, I'm so glad I didn't get out of my car and yell at them, right? That, but that's still a thing to be grateful for. Um, I think practicing gratitude is a big part of, of how I move through space. The other thing is that sometimes that also doesn't work and you're not feeling supported and everybody is against you. And why am I even doing this? And uh, for days like that, and I don't go into this folder frequently, you can't go into it too much or it stops working. I have an email folder um, that I've kept since graduate school uh, that is great emails for bad days. And those are those special emails. You know, you every once get one from a mentor or from a student that just affirms your decision to stay and keep doing what you're doing. Um, and I, I probably now go into it about once a quarter um, and just go read a few. Just go read a couple and say, okay, somebody thinks that I have value. Somebody thinks that I should be here because it can't always come from within. I'm sure for some people it can, it can't for me. Um, but that's another place to sort of reset, take a breath. Okay, now what am I, I going to do next? 
Um, another important part of those um, days or those parts of days where you just can't handle the students or the nurses on your staff or your colleagues or whoever um, is to remember that you are also a member of your team. Um, and so you have to also hold you and think about what do you need. Um, and some days that means your door is closed and you're not available. Some days that means you need to go early or that you need to miss a talk or that you want to really go to this other. Sometimes you, you have to do that. Um, and I think that that often seems very selfish, but really what that is, is a way that you can keep serving those that you want to serve. I love that. I love it. You're, you're making me think of, I know when I am in stress is when I start, we all have different physiologic response. To me, it's this panic sense of things are falling out of control. The center cannot hold. Oh my gosh. And everything's, things are dropping. And then I catastrophize and, oh my gosh, we left the name up of the blah, blah, blah table. Ah. And that's when I realized, okay, wait a minute, Kim. Um, there's clearly something going on here that you are this stressed out about that minutia. Well, that minutia is important. You're a, you're a perfectionist. You're, you take pride in good quality work. And yes, and things sometimes will fall through. And people aren't doing these things on purpose to annoy you, Kimberly. <laughs> this is not right. any malfeasance. And people don't wake up in the morning and go, Oh, what can I do? I know it's going to yeah. be over the edge. This will really get her. When I'm that, when I'm on that edge, and a name being misspelled on a spreadsheet is going to make me, you know, lose it. All right, that's a gut check of, hang on, smarty pants. You know, who in the world do you think you are? Seriously, um, come on back. Good intentions here. Look for the good, and that's when I know this is me. And you're right. So walk, shake it off. This idea of like taking a walk, right? That tree is still there. Whether you misspell the name or misspoke or uh, published something bad or you got bad summary statement back, whatever, the house is still standing. The tree is still growing. That, that doesn't mean that the experience isn't horrible. It is, but it, it helps take, take a step, a mental step back, an emotional step back and say, oh, okay, where are we really? Yeah. Not where, where do I think I am, but what, where, where am I actually in this day, in this moment? Then what needs to happen next? Um, you know, I think that I, I do a lot through action. I am a Gantt charter. I am an action step person. And so then when I can take a step back from that, then I can say, okay, let me make some real progress forward now. What, what is something I can get done, get it off my plate and look, mm -hmm. I'm a success. I answered that email, you know, that those little wins, right. um, if you allow yourself to celebrate them can be huge. Yeah. I, I also like the uh, reminding myself that even when I have my crunchy days or, um, you know, overreacting to something, I like to believe that I have set and established a culture of trust and competence and faith and we have each other kind of a place that even when we're not on our best behavior, that people will still love us and they will give us a little grace and mercy and there's forgiveness there. So just like my expectation is that people will not hold something against me personally. I have to say right back at them. This was not personal. I'm not going to demand perfection. I have to back off. I have to relax. Like you said, the tree's still there. Yeah. The tree is still there. I love it. I love how you've given us some real advice on how to do the leadership, even when times are tough. Um, those of you who are on the podcast, you probably heard the episode last week, which this ties in so well. Yeah, that was Dr. Fawaz Al-Amari. You'll want to definitely listen to these two together because uh, Fawaz talks about even if, you know, when things go wrong, even if, despite things, be positive. So this is some really good pairings of a leader here at Hopkins who clearly um, has a good handle on, on teams and certainly admired and respected. So thank you, Dr. Sarah Amond. Um, last words I'll give to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just to keep in mind what is important to you um, and then just remember that 
all the rest of the time when, when you aren't just focused on that and that there are practical tools to make that happen and you'll do great. Dr. Ammon, thank you so much. And everybody, thanks for tuning in to the Faculty Factory Podcast. Bye, Sarah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.